the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. All right, it's time to stand up and put your Bibles above your heads. All right, lift up your Bibles above your heads and repeat after me. I believe the Word of God, word of God is, smarter is smarter than I am. I choose to bring my mind and thinking, bring mind and thinking. Underneath, the thinking and mind of God. underneath the thinking and mind of God. I choose to open my heart tonight, to heart tonight. so God can speak to me through His Word. And make me who he designed me to become. Me to become. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and sit down. I want to add one simple prayer to that. Come Holy Spirit. You're the teacher of your church. Thank you for what you want to do here tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I have a strange title. Can we put it up? Is it uh, about ready to go here? There we go. How precious is death. Is that a question or an exclamation point? I hope you'll find it to be an exclamation point, but you're probably thinking, huh? Really? So let's get up to the scripture we're looking at tonight. It's Psalm 116, 15. Psalm 116, 15. It's not very long, and it's very important, so I want you to say it with me and memorize it. Can you memorize something in two minutes? All right, I'm going to say the first part, and then I want you to say it after me. Precious in the sight of the Lord, precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints, is the death of his saints. Let's say the whole thing straight through. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, as I was preparing this, I, I had some other things I wanted to share about tonight, but the Holy Spirit told me that there's going to be some people here who are dealing with death, and some of you are wrestling with God instead of relaxing in his arms and letting him instruct you. And for all of you, I think we're going to get an excitement about how death is the door into an inheritance in a heaven that God wants us to get excited about. So let's start by taking a look at who is this for? For whom is death precious? Why does God see it precious? Well, it's for those of his saints. Now, that's an interesting word. If you look at the Hebrew, uh, Pastor Deborah brought a great, profound series a few years ago on a Sunday evening about hesed, the covenant-keeping mercy of God. It's, it's the characteristic of God listed, named more often than any other characteristic of God in the Bible, even including the New Testament that wasn't written in Hebrew because it's so many times in the Old Testament. Hesed, as she said, is the covenant-keeping mercy of God. It's usually just translated with one word, mercy, sometimes loving-kindness in King James and the New King James Bibles. But it really means the covenant-keeping love of God. Because, you see, we have this amazing God who decided that he wanted to be in covenant with people. He, wanted, he, made, he made us in his image. He wanted us to long for him. He wanted us to be his partners in a kingdom thing that would make life exciting and worthwhile and have effects into eternity. And so he came. He made promises that were gracious. That's why it's called mercy. But he made promises that he came and established as a covenant. Then he came and paid for it with the blood of Jesus Christ, the broken body of Christ on the cross, and then Jesus rose up from the dead to demonstrate and prove that he had been the sacrificial offering for the establishment of that covenant so that you and I and anyone in the world, that's why we're a missionary church, can come into covenant with this God. So God is the covenant-making God. God is the covenant-establishing God. God is, God is the one who came in Jesus to pay for the covenant so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have eternal life. And now God wants us to keep covenant with him. Now, what does that have to do with his saints? Well, the Hebrew word here is the plural for chesed. It's those who are covenant keepers. So the chesedim are the ones who keep chesed. So if you are following God conscientiously, thoroughly, fully, then you are the Hasidim, and you ought to be called saints. That's why Paul wrote his letters to the saints, 
that are in Ephesus, to the saints that are in the, in, uh, uh, the Filipinos, I almost said. <laughs> the Philippines. Well, I've been there. And God loves them too. But <laughs> and the saints Peter wrote to all over the world. And James wrote to the saints all over the world. These are the holy ones. These are the covenant-keeping ones. These are the ones that God takes pleasure in their death. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Now, I, we need to take th things personally here. I, I, I took this very personally as my parents got older and older. And I went to God and said, God, I want you to show me that this verse is true when my dad dies. I want you to show me that this verse is true when my mom dies. Because they are faithful covenant keepers. They are people who have made sacrifices. They are people who have laid down their lives. My father was a retired pastor until he graduated to heaven the 30th of July, about four and a half weeks ago. And so this is very, very, very uh, palpable to me. This isn't just theory. This isn't just rational theology. This is what, how life really takes it. Is, is the death of God's saints precious in his sight? Well, let me share with you an example of one who wasn't. Ever heard of Voltaire? Voltaire was a French atheistic philosopher who provided the groundwork for the most unrighteous revolution in history, the French Revolution. And it was because of Voltaire's teaching and philosophy that carried the day in France that priests and bishops were hauled out of churches and killed along with the uh, royal families and their members. But I want you to know something about how Voltaire died. I'm going to read this to you. When Voltaire felt the stroke that he realized must terminate in death, he became overpowered with remorse. He had once sent for a priest and wanted to be reconciled with the church. He had a hard time finding one because they were all scared of him. But his infidel, unbelieving flatterers who believed his philosophy uh, didn't want that to happen, so they came running to his chamber to prevent him from recanting, but it was only to witness their ignominy and his. He cursed them to their faces, Voltaire did, and as his distress was increased by their presence, he repeated loudly and exclaimed, Be gone, it is you who have brought me to my present condition. Leave me, Voltaire said to his faithful fans. Leave me, I say, be gone. What a wretched glory is this which you have produced to me. Hoping to allay his anguish by a written recantation, he had it prepared, signed it, and saw it witnessed. But it was all unavailing. For two months he was tortured with such agony as led him at times to gnash his teeth in impotent rage against God and man. At other times, in plaintive accents, he would plead, O Christ, O Lord Jesus, have mercy. Then turning his face, he would cry out, I must die abandoned by God and by men. As his end drew near, his condition became so frightful that his infidel associates were afraid to approach his bedside. Still they guarded the door that others may not know how awfully an unbeliever would be compelled to die. Even his nurse repeatedly said for all the wealth of Europe, she would never serve another unbeliever to his death. It was a scene of horror that lies beyond all exaggeration. So, the death is not always pleasing to God or anybody else because God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But I want to share an opposite story. This is about a 10-year-old girl. Through the darkness, uh, pardon me, through the kindness of uh, a, a, a medical doctor, uh, this incident was written down. Lillian Lee, age 10, when dying, spoke to her father thus, Oh, Papa. What a sweet sight. The golden gates are opened and crowds of children come pouring out. Oh, such crowds. And they ran up to me and began to kiss me and call me by a new name. I can't even remember what it was. She lay and looked upwards, her eyes dreaming. Her voice died into a whisper as she said, Yes, yes, I come. I come. What opposite experience people have in death. If you look at the end of the seventh chapter of Acts, 54 to 56. 
we see that Stephen, the first martyr, looked up and said, well, they gnashed at Stephen with their teeth. That's verse 56. Do we have verse 54? Stephen looked up and he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And that was his experience of death that showed that his death was precious. The heavens opened and the Son of God standing at, the, at his right hand. Um, my own aunt, one of my aunts, my mother's brother's wife, uh, passed away just within the past year. And she had a similar experience. Uh, her husband, uh, they had been married for, I think it was close to 70 years, like my parents. And they, they were leaders in their church. They were faithful people. And uh, Uncle uh, Earl passed away about four years earlier. We were all surprised that Aunt Edna lived as long as she did. But her hearing went, her seeing went. It was very difficult to converse with her daughters, but one of her daughters, my cousin Donna, called me and talked to me about it because the afternoon that she died, she suddenly came alert. She could see, she could hear, she could speak, and then, just before she passed, she said, Oh, Earl, look, Donna, it's Earl. He's, he's waiting for me. He's right up there. And that was the last thing that they heard her say before she graduated into heaven. So, you know, I, th th this, is, th this isn't just thinking. This isn't just theory. This is stuff that is, is powerful, that makes a difference in our lives. And I want you to know that it... The death of God's saints is precious in his sight. Now, I've, I found a URL that I asked them to share. Let's see if they can put it up there. You might want to write this one down. There's a lot of garbage on the uh, Internet, as you well know, and a lot of heresy, particularly about heaven and about hell. But this is one that has about 200 testimonies that are trustworthy about people who experienced hell, unbelievers, before they de died or believers who experienced God and were able to see and share it and have somebody write it down. So I want you, you know, if, if this will help you, I want you to know that this, there's a lot of people that have experienced these kinds of things. Now, let's look on to why it's precious to God. Why is the death of a saint precious to God? Well, let's go to first to 1 Peter 1. In 1 Peter 1, Peter is writing, he has this amazing statement about salvation right at the beginning of his... Um, general epistle and he says let's see let's look start at verse verse 3 praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead see I'm wearing my resurrection tie this is uh, the angel on the rock that was rolled away, telling that Jesus is not there. He's alive. The re uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, into, new, born into what? Born again into an inheritance that can never perish, incorruptible, unfadable, and undefiled, kept in heaven for you. So God has an inheritance that he wants to give you. Your papa's rich. Ha. Fabulously rich. And he's got stuff he wants to give you, and he's looking forward to you coming up there so he can give it to you and you can enjoy it. But you don't qualify yet. 1 Corinthians 15.50 Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So, why does God look forward to your death? <coughs> so he can give you what he's got, because he can't give it to you until you get there. Now, just turn in your Bibles to Revelation 21, 1 to 7. I was thinking about this this afternoon after I had my stuff sent in and was sitting down asking the Lord what he wanted to do with it all. You know, I got to realizing, if you're depressed, 
You ought to memorize this, the reference, the first seven verses of Revelation 21. Or if you're not good with biblical references, think of it this way. The next to the last chapter at the end of the book. Because there's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so if you open at the back of your Bible and turn in one chapter, you'll find Revelation 21. This is amazing stuff. This is the kind of stuff to make you drool if you can picture it and get, let, let your heart get a hold of it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Hallelujah. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son or daughter. Wow. See, if you're depressed, you read this out loud three times in a row, that depression can't stay. Or else it'll make you want to set your hope where this will be true for you. And then God will be waiting and ready to do it. You know, I... I, I, was trying to think, how can we picture how God would be about the inheritance that he's looking forward to giving you? Pretend that you have a son who's 14 and a half. And he's a good boy. He's been working hard. He's getting good grades in school. He's making you proud as a son. And you're thinking, you know what? Things are kind of tight, but I sure would love to give him a brand new car for his 16th birthday. Now, if you wanted to do that, that would take some doing, wouldn't it? You would have to figure, you'd have to plan, you'd have to talk to your wife or your husband, you'd have to look at how you're going to arrange the finances, you'd have to make plans, you'd have to go out and you'd be looking to find out what kind of a car he wanted, you'd be ready to get it, you'd be setting it up, you'd be saving this money, and the closer it gets, the more excited you're getting about it, and when it comes to that day, I mean, you're figuring out how can we get this car in the driveway so that he won't see it until I give him the keys, and how can we do it so that when I hand him these keys, I'm going to see the look on his face. He is going to be so happy. Now, you see, we're created in the image of God. We're like that because God's like that. And God is wanting to give you an enormous inheritance that he's been planning for millennia. He wants to make you happy. He's got it. He's streets paved with gold. I mean, plenty of food and water, sweet fruit. Wow, God's got it already, and he's got plans, and he can hardly wait to give it to you. You see why God is looking on your death as precious? Maybe you should start looking at your death as precious. Not enough to be stupid enough to commit suicide. God's got plans for you but enough to want what God has for you, what God wants to give you, to look forward to your own death, to realize and remember that you're not not staked to the earth. You're like the eagle. You were designed to soar. (laughs) Jesus said something that struck me as strange in, in John 14. He said, you know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God the Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. This is the part that that has struck me as, huh? If it were not so, I would have told you. Why would Jesus say that? That means, does that mean that God wants us to be expecting him to give us good things? Yes, it does. 
Because Jesus said, if, if I weren't going to have a lot of good stuff to give you, I'd be ashamed and, I, and I, I wouldn't want you to know. But I want you to know. And it's good. You don't have to be troubled. Now, the dying process may be painful. depends on how it happens to different people. But death is the entrance into glory. It's the door into heaven. You know, that, that marvelous chapter of Hebrews 11 lists Abra, uh, Esau, pardon me, well, Enoch, and Abraham, and Moses, and a bunch of others. These great people that walked with God, that trusted God, that believed God, that risked all for God. And you know what? Towards the end of that, well, about halfway into that chapter in verse 16, God says, you know what? I'm not ashamed to, for them to, be called, to call me their God because I've got inheritance for them. God is not embarrassed. You, you're not going to embarrass God when it comes to giving presents. God is not ashamed for, to hear people call him your God because he's got good stuff for you that's going to make you glad that he's your God. And that good stuff isn't all material either. So that's why it's precious to God. Let's consider why it should be precious to us for a few minutes. There are some specific promises and, and when I was uh, in seminary, this struck me as strange. You know, Matthew 5, 12. Great, great is your reward in heaven. How about Matthew 6, 20? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And I read that as a, a seminary student, and I thought, I thought we were supposed to be selfless. What happened to sacrificial love? Isn't this appealing to our desire to acquire things? You follow where I... But, but Jesus didn't apologize. You know what? I think most Christians, rather than wanting too much, want too little. If you would believe that there's heaven up there that's worth investing in more than the stock market, more than the real estate, more than your job, more than your education, if you would believe that there's an eternal reward that you can invest to get, is that selfish? Well, whatever it is, Jesus is trying to stir it up in you. <laughs> and I don't think it is selfish. Jesus wants you to know that he's got good things for you. Jesus wants you to stir up yourself to lay up treasure in heaven. And that's why there's verses in the Old Testament like when you give to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord. Why would the writer of Proverbs, why would the Holy Spirit have him write that? Because he wants us to give to the poor. Because he wants us to have the idea of serving people in Jesus' name, meaning we're lending to God and God's going to owe us? Huh? Wait a minute. I thought... We were the servants, and he was the master. Well, the master is good, and he wants to pay you well for what you do for him. He wants to pay you eternally. Is this a rewards, is this a works righteousness? No. We do these things because we're grateful to God, and we understand that God knows our nature, and he's not going to dissatisfy us when it comes to the rewards, because he's got a lot of them. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. One of the things about living down here is our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the next verse who by the power that enables him to bring ever, everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will look like his glorious body. What's going on here? I, I thought we weren't supposed to be vain about our bodies. We, we should want a body that's more powerful, more beautiful, more effective. One like Jesus had. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus passed in his resurrection body. He passed through a closed door. Jesus in his resurrection body defied gravity and it centered up into heaven. Jesus in his resurrected body did some things that, you, that might surprise you. 
Linda and I watched uh, the, the movie Shadowlands about uh, C.S. Lewis and his wife uh, just uh, about a week and a half ago, a week ago, uh, again, because the Lord was moving me in this direction in terms of, of, of the message tonight. And one of the startling things that, that I love to hear in that sad movie, but powerful, vigor, invigorating movie, is that, well, the, the, the story is that C.S. Lewis's wife died of cancer in middle age. Now, that's a horrible thing. And, of course, they saw it coming. And how do you live with that as a Christian? As a Christian professor, as a Christian theologian. And C.S. Lewis, actually, you, you, you may not know this, but C.S. Lewis wrote, you know, he's probably got 15 or 20 books published. But during the time that his wife was going through this, he decided to write a memoir and with a journaling that he called A Grief Observed, and he took a pseudoname, instead of publishing it under his own name, while he was writing it and getting it ready, because he was afraid that he might lose his faith during going through this terrible experience with his wife that was dying of cancer. And this is the guy that gets invited to preach in the biggest churches all over England during World War II to strengthen and encourage the people of God and was a professor at the University of Cambridge. But he, he did publish it. It came out that it deepened his faith and strengthened his faith and it's now printed under his name. But one of the things that he, he says towards the end of the movie after she has died and he's uh, with her son, uh, who is, what, 11 or 12, something like that, and they're, they're going through the grief of life without her, and they have a conversation, and C.S. Lewis tells his wife's son, because she had been prior married, real life hasn't yet begun. Real life hasn't yet begun. You know, I believe that the colors in heaven are going to be so brilliant that you'll be able to taste them. I believe that the sounds of heaven are going to be so rich that they will give you visions and you'll be able to see what they smell like. C.S. Lewis wrote this, what if that the... the uh, non-resurrected bodies can't walk on the blades of grass in heaven because the blades of grass are so real they'll cut the feet if you don't have resurrected bodies. Paul said that we will know as we are known. And my dad is knowing like he's been known and I've been wanting to know for years and years since he's been there the past month. I think in heaven we're going to be able to see without opening our eyes. I even had an experience on earth like that once when I was in college. God came and visited me in my room because I was in need of encouragement. It's one of five or six amazing times that God has physically shown up in my presence so that I could know that he was there. I, I, I wish that for all of you. And, and, I, and I don't say that to make you envious. I say that to ask you to pray. Jesus said in John 14 that he and the Father wanted to come and manifest themselves to you. So have you been asking him to? I'd been asked. My father trained me to ask him to from the time I was 13 or 14. And the first time didn't happen until I was about 20. But God came in my room, and he was a yellowish gold ball of fire. It was about this big, and it was right back up here uh, off my right shoulder. And how do I know that? I knew it was God. I was afraid. I understand why these guys say God shows up, and man, they fall on their faces. And God says, you know, rise up. I, 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 I refused to open my eyes because I was afraid I'd be destroyed if I saw God. And yet, with my eyes closed, looking a different direction, I knew what was there and what he looked like and how he, what form he had appeared in. Now, when you start thinking about 
resurrection bodies. God has got plans for you that are, I mean, one, one of the things that I've learned, people ask me sometimes, will, our, will my pets be in heaven? Or will such and such happen? You know what? I've decided that it doesn't matter what you tell them because they're not going to be disappointed anyway. <laughs> Because God's got such wonderful plans, and we should be looking forward to it. There's a longing for heaven that God created us with. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, we used to sing a song, God makes all things beautiful in his time, in his time. Anyone remember that song? In his time, in his time. Yeah, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. One of the ways that we know that we're strange and strangers and pilgrims in this land is because those who don't know the Lord treat us as weird. I'm, I'm a chemistry teacher uh, at Rialto High School. And uh, since I'm a leader in my school, we sometimes get to meet with leaders from other high schools in the, in the district. And I was at one of those district meetings. And uh, we were there early and somebody had asked me a question and I was sharing an answer to prayer. And... Uh, as soon as I finished, and I, I thought it was really cool, and the, people, pre, the two people at the table that were listening to me, they were saying, wow, really? And uh, this one, one woman from another table said, you know what, I don't have to take all that stuff so personally. What does that mean? <laughs> that was her defense mechanism. Because she had a longing for heaven that she wasn't wanting to admit. She has a God-shaped vacuum, too, that's empty. But she didn't want anyone to know it. She didn't want to know it herself. And so she had come up with this philosophical reaction to any answer to prayer that says, well, you take everything personally, but I'm above that. You see, I, I'm, I'm more intellectual. I understand. I have better philosophy to deal with things. Well, they make us feel uh, in the world like we're strange. We, we are different, but the longing for heaven is there, and we can look for, for God to open them up. Second, uh, pardon me, 1 Peter 2.11. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. See, Peter recognizes that, that we are not like the people around us. We're different. Some, there are some things that are strained here. Um, about six, five months ago, Linda and I had the great privilege of being in China representing the Rock Church and World Outreach Center and representing the International Schools of Ministry with 5,000 diplomas for underground church pastors who had passed the International School of Ministry and were uh, better leaders in the church now. And, and the, the, it was on the 31st of March, which was Easter Sunday, that we had the great privilege of having dinner with Brother Zhang, who is the founder and the leader of the largest underground church in China. They have over 10 million members and a plan to turn it to 20 million. Yes, hallelujah. And Lynn and I can testify that the name of Jesus brings healing and deliverance in China, not just in America. It also, we, we've had the privilege, it does it in Indonesia. It does it in the Philippines. It does it in Bangladesh. It does it in the Ukraine and in the United States. The name of Jesus is powerful all over the world. But, it, but my birthday was on the Thursday before Easter. And so I was speaking to my translator while we were driving up to meet with about 300 pastors uh, in, near the North Korean border. Um, and I... I told, I told him, I said, you know, my, my birthday is today, and I was wondering if you'd mind asking if any of these pastors have been in prison for the gospel because I'd love to have the honor of washing the feet of a pastor who's been in prison for the gospel. And he looked at me like I didn't know where I was. <laughs> and he said, washing feet is not a problem. But he very respectfully said, if I were to ask which pastors had been imprisoned for the gospel, the few that haven't would be publicly embarrassed. <sighs> yeah, wow. Uh, you see, we, we are sojourners and pilgrims, and we are strange to the world, but we keep 
But God has put this longing for heaven in us. God has worked in our hearts. God has brought us to salvation. God is bringing us to fuller and more complete and effective salvation. There are some times when I have longed for heaven. I remember when uh, uh, I was back in Bible college uh, on the night of finals. Somebody would tease about, well, let's have a prayer meeting and pray for the Lord to come before the night's over. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's kind of fun, but no, it never happened. Um, but there are times in our lives when we long for heaven very deeply. There was a time when Linda and me, our marriage was split. She had left and taken our three daughters, and I was lonely, and I was pained, and I was miserable, and I was crying out to God, and I was crying through the night, and I was singing songs about heaven. Because I wanted something better than what I was experiencing. You see, when, when life gets tough and things are going the wrong way, it helps to remind us that there's a better place, that we weren't made to stay here, that this is temporary, that God has better things ahead. And I praise God that he had better things ahead for us, too, because... He changed my heart first, and then he changed her heart, and we have an amazing testimony of how God wants families to be, and that through is better than out. You know, sometimes we, we can taste the palpable evil around us. I can remember back in 1973, which is one of the first times this happened to me, we were uh, serving a church in Burbank, and on the television came these pictures from the Yom Kippur War. This was at the beginning of it, before the Israelites got on top of things and whipped, whipped the Arabs. But at the beginning, they were getting the worst end of it, and it was looking awful, and we were crying, and we were crying out to God. When, when, you, when you're faced with evil and people are being wiped out unjustly, there's something inside that says, no! And that's, the, that's, the, that, that's part of how God made us. That's the longing for heaven. That's the wanting it the way God wants it instead. Now, the, the next few minutes, I'm going to take just a little personal time to talk about a case study of God answering, because I prayed this Psalm 116, 15 prayer for quite a while. I have been praying it for about 10 or 12 years, as Dad's been getting older and older. And it may not be like your experience, and I, and so I, I need to say something about that. Two things, because my dad passed away at 94, having lived a full, satisfying, effective uh, fruitful life. But that's not how it happens with everybody. And in case it happened, doesn't, you're, you're dealing with a death that's very different. I want you to know two things. Just because it happened doesn't mean it was God's will. Sometimes God doesn't always get what he wants. And sometimes the devil gets away with things that he should not. And it's right for us to rail against the enemy and cry out to heaven for relief and to show what's going on. Because sometimes it's just too terrible and it doesn't make sense and it's all against everything that we believe and teach. And yet, the second thing that you need to hold on to in that type of situation is that God, as the sovereign Lord of history, will only allow enough evil in your life that will can be turned completely around by your cooperation with him until you have such a testimony that you can thank God that it happened that way until you're even like Nebuchadnezzar, who that... Uh, Terrible old man, finally, after seven years of crawling on his hands and knees, admitted that God was right in all that he had done. And God may be working on some very difficult things with some of you. And so please don't take what I'm going to say next as glibly, because God is big enough and sufficient for grace in your situation. But I'm looking at a very different one. It was uh, John 19.30. I was talking... Uh, with my dad about this verse about six years ago. This is where about when Jesus died. Do you think Jesus was a victim? Jesus was not an innocent victim. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit. Another uh, gospel says, I commit, Father, I commit my spirit to you. Jesus didn't just lie there until he couldn't live any longer and died as a victim. Jesus saw the time of God's 
passing for him the right time of the death, and Jesus gave his spirit to the Father. It was not taken from him by the enemy. And I had discussed this with my dad, because we were talking about, you know, up in Oregon about six or seven years ago, when they were arguing about whether uh, uh, su assisted suicide should be made legal. And, and we agreed with the word of God that it should not, that our times are in his hands. Just like we don't kill unborn babies, we don't kill old people because they're useless or, pain or full of pain or whatever. We let God have his time in it. But I said, but what about this, Dad, when it comes close to your passing? He was 89, 88 maybe. Do you want to have a say in how you die? I think God gives you the privilege. I think God wants you to be able to do as Jesus did and decide when you can give up your spirit if it works out right. And he agreed with me. And he thought, yes. Well, so, eight days before he passed away, he had a massive stroke that was just about, what, 20, 22nd of July, just uh, about six, or six weeks ago. And he, he suddenly couldn't control himself anymore. They had to take him to a hospital, emergency room, uh, put him in an ICU, and uh, he was only partially alert, and mom was there with him. And he had signed advanced directives saying that he didn't want any un his body kept alive in unnatural means. He lived a full life. He had been talking for years about going to heaven. He never complained, though. That was the amazing thing. Instead of all, in spite of all his pain, the evidence of holiness was all over him uh, in the way he praised God. But, but they, they tried to put a tube down his, uh, through his nose and down into his stomach to feed him, and he pushed it away, which is his way of saying, I'm giving up my spirit now. You're not, you're not, you're, you're not going to keep me out of heaven any longer. <laughs> And mom would have done that for him, but what a blessing that he was able to do it himself. As it turned out, I, on the morning that he died, I was troubled about some things. It had been eight days, and it wasn't making sense. He hadn't been able to communicate. Things were not going the way we thought they would. We had agreed the second day, my mom and my brothers and my sister, that we would be praying for God to take him home because that's what he wanted. Mom agreed that we should pray that way. They would have been married 70 years. 70th anniversary was the 29th, last Thursday. Would have been their 70th wedding anniversary. And but here it was on, on this morning, and I was praying, and I was saying, God, how I, I, I was torn up. I was frustrated. I, I was in my, uh, in my laundry room. That's my prayer room at my house. I go in there and close the door, and I can pray anything I want early in the morning, and that's where I do it. And, and God listens to me, and sometimes he even speaks. And I, and I ask God, how can you love this body in the condition that it is? I mean, how, how, can, you love, uh, how can you love anybody? You're such a holy God. And when I finally ran out of frustration in words and got quiet, I heard this, I want him. And I thought, I want him? What does that have to do with what I was asking you about? But I, I've learned to accept what God says and put it on the shelf and trust God to show me later what it means. Well, how precious is that? Three hours before my dad passed, graduated into heaven, God told me as if he needed to, because I was listening, because I wanted to know that the reason he's taken him is because he wants him. God has wanted him all these years. God wants you. Probably not tonight. <laughs> But God wants you. And in reflecting on it, I've realized God showed me how precious in his sight the death of my father is because that's how God gets him. God says, I want him, and this is how I'm taking him. But God, God needed to wait, and this is amazing to me. 
until my mother gave him permission to go about an hour before he died. I, I, I believe that God respects love so much. And I, had, and, and I had prayed about it, and the Lord had given me some counsel, and I had shared with Mom her, needed, her need to share with Dad that it was okay for him to go. And she told me, at, when she called me to t to later that day, after she told me that he had passed, she said, you know what? I, I, during that night, before he passed, I, I cried. I had to confess and ask God to forgive me for holding him on so tightly I, and, and to tell God, it's okay, you can have him, Father. He's, it's too much pain. I don't want to watch him suffer any more pain. He was taking morphine. And she said that she, she, had, we, she, we had, she had been waiting for six days for him to have a clear moment so she could talk, and he never got clear. So she told me that she went that morning and she yelled into his ear because he was so hard of hearing, it's okay. You can go to heaven now. You don't have to stay until our 70th anniversary. And she was crying while she was telling me this on the phone, but then she said, it was so good because within an hour he was gone. And he doesn't have the pain anymore. And three of us have seen him worshiping in heaven in vision since then. I mean, you know, it's amazing. God is so good. And his, he, your death is precious in his sight if you're one of his holy ones, if you're one of his ones who's keeping covenant. Your death is precious in God's sight. Will you ponder that for a moment? Consider, can you accept that your death is going to be precious in its time when God comes? Can you accept that the death of those that you miss the most was precious in God's sight? Almighty God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that your word tells us what's eternally true, what we can memorize and meditate on and mold our lives after, because you're the God who paid the price, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and freely offer eternal life to all who believe in you and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. That was very personal, but now I want to do something else that's very personal. I'm afraid that there are some of you here tonight who, if God did call for you tonight, heaven wouldn't be your home. And I don't say that because I'm mean. I say that because I love you, and God loves you, and he doesn't want it to stay that way. God wants to transfer you into his kingdom. He wants you to become a bona fide member tonight of his eternal family by agreeing with God about the wickedness of your own sins, asking God to have mercy on you because Jesus died for you, and give your life to him tonight as a first night to follow him consistently and thoroughly. You can't get to heaven by being good. Nobody can. My dad, as good as he was, couldn't get to heaven by being good because he was a sinner like the rest of us. You, you can't get to heaven by having church membership. You can't get to heaven by being baptized or taking the sacrament of Eucharist. You can't get to heaven by giving one testimony one time. If all of these become your way of life because your heart and spirit have changed, then you've been born again and you are one of these ones who is following God or is going to be following God and God will take pleasure in your death. But if you only do it for show or to try to prove that you're somebody, it won't work. You have to give up your own ability and your own efforts and say, I throw myself on the hands of Jesus. 
Nothing in my hands I bring. Strictly to the cross I cling. And come and trust Jesus. I've asked the Holy Spirit tonight to prepare the hearts of those that need to make this decision. Maybe you've made a decision like it in the past and you're remembering that, but you haven't kept it. Maybe you're thinking that you're too terrible and that you're not good enough and God would never forgive you. Oh, God wants you to know that he'll forgive everything. He's not shocked by your sins. He's not pushed away by them. He wants to bring you in and give you life. So in a moment, I'm going to clap my hands together and ask you at that point to raise your hand. What will that mean? That means you're saying, I want God to take pleasure in my death. I want my death to be precious in God's sight. I want to go to heaven when I die. So I'm willing to give my life fully to Jesus so I can follow him and live the way he wants me to and look forward to eternal life that I can experience already here and now by walking with God and having the joy and strength he gives. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three, bam. Raise your hand if you would like to give your life to Jesus tonight. I see that hand, thank you. Any others? Yes, I see that hand, thank you, that's two. Anyone else? Want to make tonight your eternal destiny change? So that you can accept, thank you, there's three. So that you can accept what God has for you and anticipate the inheritance he wants to give you when you finally get to heaven and find out what joy it is that he wants to walk with you every day and help you and strengthen you and make your life meaningful and a blessing to others. Almighty God, I thank you for these three that have raised their hands and I think there are three or four more who also know they need to. And I thank you for your spirit present to give them boldness to rise and get into the aisle and come down. I want to invite you, if you raise your hand or if you should have, let's everybody stand now, please. And if you're one of the ones that needs to come forward, just be bold, bring your stuff, get into the aisle, come down here. Let me shake your hand, praise you, praise God for your wisdom. God's got good stuff for you in the future. Hallelujah. Come on down. God bless you, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate what you do. God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Ah, uh, one more. Yes, thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Still coming. Don't keep coming if you like. Well, thank you. Welcome. Welcome. God bless you, sir. All right, we have uh, Pastor Joel here. He's the one waving at you right now. Um, we have a little room we'd like to, you to go back in. We're not going to do anything weird or strange. We're going to give you a few free things. And you, yes, hallelujah. Come on down. Hallelujah. You're not... You're not saved because God loves you. You're saved when you invite Jesus into your heart and life. Hallelujah. And that's the beginning. Hallelujah. That's the beginning of your walk with God. And there's so much ahead. And Pastor Joel will share with that with you, give you a few free things, lead you in the prayer in which you invite Jesus to take over your life and then offer you an SPT. We give friends here at the Rock. Isn't that amazing? We give friends that'll help you come back and study your Bible and learn some key things that'll help you grow. And you know what? We have found that if you, that the people who make a commitment 
to give a year of their life coming here to church and doing as the pastors here give you encouragement to do, your life will be changed for the rest of your life. It's so important. Is that right, friends? Yeah, yeah. So important for you not just to get a great night with a, the right prayer, but a, starting a pattern of living with God with people that'll help you. So let's praise God as these people turn to your uh, left, please. Follow Pastor Joel into this little room. Thank you for coming. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.